Greetings and thank you for joining us for NAC at Home, a conversation about the influence of old masters on contemporary culture. My name is Charles Snyder, and on behalf of the Roundtable Committee of the National Arts Club, welcome. The National Arts Club is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are based in New York City. Our mission is to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. How do we do that? We do that by offering more than 150 free programs to the public each year, including art exhibitions, theatrical performances, musical performances, lectures, and readings. Visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And now, the National Arts Club is proud and delighted to welcome your host, Alex Merrill, creator of the critically acclaimed culture podcast, The Inspirati, and her guest, Dr. Julia Martina Weston, art historian and specialist in Renaissance and early modern art at Sotheby's Institute of Arts in London. Please use the Q&A during the program for any questions that come up. And now, on behalf of the National Arts Club, Alex, Dr. Weston, thank you and welcome. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Huge thank you to you, Charles, and to the National Arts Club for having us. I'm very excited to be here today discussing the influence of old masters on contemporary culture. This topic fits really beautifully within a larger fascination I have around art's ability to communicate across centuries, across continents, across creative industries, and in witnessing how creative works can continue to inspire long after their makers have left, it's really beautiful to me that art is seemingly always in conversation with itself in this eternal dialogue about the human experience. I've spent the past 15 years working with luxury brands internationally as both a creative director and a DJ. I've contributed as a writer, photographer, and host for clients like Vogue, Travel and Leisure, and Porsche. Prior to the pandemic, I was based between New York and Los Angeles, but when travel and events came to a screeching halt last year, I came back to my hometown of Vancouver, Canada to spend time with my family and read group and ended up starting the Inspirati, which began as a little podcast and grew into a full creative studio with projects across media, spirits, and hospitality in the works. But during the months when I was trying to figure out my next steps, I really turned back to learning and started taking Italian and tennis and art history at Sotheby's. One of my lectures was the incredible Dr. Weston, and I found her to be such an engaging speaker that I wanted to have her on the podcast, but we quickly realized that this was the topic we wanted to explore together and it would benefit the topic to be hosted on a platform where visuals could be shared and the stars aligned with the National Arts Club and here we are. So Julia, thank you so much for being here with me today and would you please start by telling us a bit about your journey in art history? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Alex, and welcome everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure being here. Um, my name is Julia Weston. Um, I was born and raised in Rome where I studied art history at La Sapienza University. And then I moved to London for my PhD at the Courtauld Institute of Art, where I later worked as associate lecturer. And over the last few years, I've been consultant lecturer at Sotheby's Institute, um, teaching for the Master in Fine and Decorative Arts and Design. And um, I also lecture regularly at the London Art History Society and I'm currently a member of the Center for the Study of Medicine and the Body in the Renaissance, which is based in Pisa. Wonderful. And how was your interest in street art ignited? So uh, when I moved to London for my PhD, I witnessed the realization of a very inspiring, very fascinating project. Um, that is the Dulwich Outdoor Gallery. And um, for, for this project, prominent street artists, uh, mainly from the UK, but also from, from Belgium, Mexico and South Africa, um, have been asked to be inspired by um, the old masters of Dulwich Picture Gallery. 
And Delage Picture Gallery is in southeast London and um, it was founded in 1811. And in fact, it, it's England's oldest uh, gallery, public gallery. And it's particularly famous for its Baroque paintings. So I think at the heart of this project, there was the idea of defeating, the, the attempt uh, to defeat the prejudice that the typical person who loves street art may not be particularly keen on Baroque paintings and, 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 and vice versa. Um, so I think um, the, the project really worked its magic on me. Uh, I, I think this, this cross fertilization between street art and fine art uh, benefits um, uh, both, uh, both of them and, and really increasing, in, in, increasing at the same time our understanding of, of both of them. So I would like to share with you some of my favorite examples from that project. Um, so what you see here on slide to the left um, is one of the gallery's um, most famous masterpieces, that is Rembrandt's Girl at a Window, uh, which was painted in uh, 1645. And this is a mysterious, um, iconic uh, figure. Um, it's possibly a character type rather than a, a real portrait. Um, and it's been interpreted as a courtesan, but also as a biblical figure. And I think the idea of producing a 21st century iconic figure has also inspired um, the work to the right of the slide, which was completed by Street Artist System in 2013. And as you can see, the girl is here reinterpreted as a graffiti artist. Um, the pose of Rembrandt's prototype is reiterated, but the white dress has become a white uh, hoodie. And one other interesting aspect of um, the project is that the surrounding environment has been considered, and this is exactly what you would do in a display of old master paintings. So for instance, the wall um, chosen by street artist Flegg, which you see here to the left of, of the slide, um, is passed by primary school children at all, at all times. So um, he decides to turn the key figure um, of uh, Nicolas Poussin's um, Triumph of David, the figure of the trumpeteer, into a fantastical creature. And this is possibly to please um, a very young audience. Um, and this is a, a slightly later piece, um, which was produced in 2015 by German street artist Matt C. Um, and this reinterprets another very famous um, painting in Dulwich Picture Gallery, that is Venetia, Lady Digby on a deathbed, um, which was painted by Sir Anthony van Dyck. Um, and once again, I think um, the site um, is particularly evocative here. Um, the shape of the roof um, really matches van Dyck's patterns of bedding. Um, and Matt C also reiterates Van Dyck's depiction of um, Venetia um, as if um, she is floating um, um, on, on clouds um, against a, a blue sky. And what I also find fascinating here is that um, the woman is painted in a rather abstract way, but the declining rose uh, with uh, its falling petals um, are quite realistic. Um, and um, what um, is um, also quite intriguing, I think, is that Van Dyck's portrait was meant to record the transitory uh, beauty of Venetia's corpse. And um, at the same time, the, um, the, the, the street art Venetia um, really succeeds at breathing new life into this particular old master. So there's an interesting juxtaposition, I think, um, uh, between um, death and life here, between um, the old and new. Uh, and that, that to me is particularly inspiring. I love looking at these pieces side by side. They're such an amazing pair. Uh, outside of this particular project, what other pieces of street art have you loved that are in conversation with art of the past? 
Yes, um, there is another um, great uh, frieze which I admire, which is very close to my heart, um, which is in Rome. And I think both encapsulates and goes beyond the lesson of the past. And it's the work that you see on screen here, um, Triumphs and Laments, um, which is a 500 meter frieze on the walls of the Tiber made by South African artist, William Kentridge. And the frieze actually covers the longest straight riverfront in Rome, which is between Ponte Sisto and Ponte Mazzini. And it portrays um, victories and defeats um, from the history of Rome, um, showing a sort of procession of mythological, historical and iconic figures. So chronologically, it spans from the legendary founding of Rome, which is evoked here by the twins Romulus and Ramus fed by the she-wolf, to the Dolce Vita um, with Anita Ekberg and Marcello Mastroianni uh, here in the, in the detail, which are borrowed from Fellini's movie. And here the Trevi Fountain is rethought as a bath. So uh, the first question would be what is borrowed from the past? Uh, certainly the uh, idea of celebrating uh, military triumphs was central in Roman art. And uh, an example of, of this is the column of Marcus Aurelius um, in Piazza Colonna in Rome, on which a spiral picture relief tells the story of the Danubian Wars. And during the Renaissance, um, there were frequent attempts to revive the splendor of classical antiquity through painting. And perhaps the most remarkable attempt um, of this kind is Andre Mantegna's set of nine canvases known as the Triumph of Caesar. Um, and these were painted for Francesco II Gonzaga of Mantua from 1485. And this is a canvas um, to, to the left of the slide from that series. Uh, and as you can see, the picture bearers preceded by trumpeters are holding panels um, showing episodes from military triumphs. And um, the next issue I'd like to consider briefly is the actual making of triumphs and laments, uh, because this is where the project goes beyond uh, tradition um, to become something unique. So Kentridge initially worked from his studio in Johannesburg, uh, producing small charcoal drawings. And these were later followed by uh, larger ink drawings, uh, which were later turned into digital files that were sent to a factory in Rome in order to produce full, full scale plastic stencils. Um, so what you see uh, from the picture um, at the bottom of the slide is um, the moment in which the plastic stencils are placed against the wall and water from the river is sprayed at pressure onto the stone and all around the stencil. So basically the white parts um, are those which have been exposed to this cleaning and the black areas are where this crust of pollution, this sort of patina is still in place. And um, this is a practical example of how a Baroque um, sculpture, in this case is um, Gian Lorenzo Bernini's Apollo and Daphne in the Borghese Gallery, is transposed onto a drawing first and later turned into a frieze. Um, so that there is an element of triumph here. Uh, the sculptural group itself really embodies um, the triumph, the aesthetical, but also technical perfection of the Baroque. But there is also an allusion to fragility, to perishability, because the frieze will gradually fade away, darkened again by pollution, fading like memory fades. Um, so, um, and, and, and I think it's, 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 it's interesting to consider that now works that fade are perishable, 
uh, even self-destroying after uh, immediately after the purchase um, are not particularly unusual. And in fact, we may even suppose that um, this ephemerality brings um, value uh, to the artwork, brightens the aura of, of the artwork. But um, this was certainly not the case of uh, Renaissance artworks. Um, during the Renaissance and the early modern period, um, supports, especially stone supports, were much admired. Um, so um, the, the, the durability of stone um, was sought after um, as a means to increase the value of a painting, the symbolic value and, and also the economic value of a piece. And I think when, in order to uh, ponder the status of um, stones during the Renaissance, it is important to acknowledge um, two phenomena. So the first one is the establishment of the workshop for hardstone, the Opificio delle Pietre Dure, which was um, founded in Florence by Ferdinand I Medici in 1588. And, and this was a permanent workshop which produced inlaid or commesso pictures, usually of uh, floral subject, but also landscapes, uh, as in the case of this superb tabletop with the uh, harbor of Legend. Um, and as you can see here from, from this example, the pictorial possibilities of the various hard stones are fully exploited. And, and this is really a, a painting of stones. But at the same time, the second phenomenon, uh, I think it's important to consider is the crafting of paintings on stone, such as Cavalier d'Arpino's Perseus, Rescue uh, Andromeda. Um, and in this case, the precious Lapis Lazuli is used to represent the sky and some of the water in, in the composition. And this is really a miniature masterpiece. Um, and in this case, the preciousness of the support is matched by the virtuosic execution of the figures. Uh, and I guess my favorite detail here is the uh, visual proximity um, between the natural crack of the stone uh, and the positioning of Andromeda's feet, which are just above uh, this crack. Um, and um, I think that this uh, detail really encapsulates the unique relationship between nature and art, which this works really wanted to, to showcase. And um, at the same time, the, the preciousness, the aesthetic purity of stone made it uh, particularly suitable for portraits of eminent figures. Um, and this is um, the case of Sebastiano del Piombo's uh, portrait of, Paul, Paul, uh, of Pope Paul III, Farnese and his nephew, um, and obviously um, religious subjects um, as um, Titian's uh, incredible Ece Homo in uh, Madrid at the Prado. And in both cases, the use of slate is uh, associated with imperishability, with perfection, and the paint technique painting technique is uh, extremely controlled so that the, these uh, paintings were really believed to be perfect, to be um, almost eternal. I think highlighting patronage here is a really interesting point as well. Rome was a capital of the art world, obviously very much because it was the seat of the Catholic church and the church used artists works to seduce people with this kind of breathtaking beauty and sort of untouchable grandeur. And if you think of that religion as the dominant set of guiding principles that governed how people interacted within society, what would you replace that with now? You could very easily argue that capitalism has usurped the church as the way of thinking that drives modern Western society with 
consumption of goods, overtaking deity worship as a main driver for making people feel whole, however fleetingly, as a value system. But what's interesting here is that patronage of the arts followed in this juxtaposition of the church's patronage and modern brands, the sort of clergy of our capitalist society, using artists and artworks in both their goods and their marketing, there are many similarities in that they're both forms essentially of advertising a lifestyle, whether it's one of piety or of indulgence, of modesty or of flashiness. And I know you have some references to share on brands as these newer patrons of the arts. Yes, thank you, Alex. This is a very thought-provoking point. And uh, I think one, one aspect to, to highlight in contemporary creative industries is the survival of a set of symbolical associations which were pioneered um, and deployed by the Catholic Church. So um, I think a fascinating appropriation of this kind um, is um, visible here in this uh, Fiat 600 Multipla uh, from the 1970s, but completely refurbished and turned into an artwork by Garage Italia. And this is a unique piece which was created for the St. Regis Hotel in, in Rome. And the ceiling of this car quotes uh, perhaps the most famous ceiling or one of the most famous ceilings of the Baroque period. So the ceiling in question is the one frescoed by Pietro da Cortona in the Great Hall of Palazzo Barberini in Rome. And the fresco decoration of this huge um, ceiling was carried out between 1632 and 1639. The, um, the, the, the theme depicted is the triumph of the divine providence. Um, so the divine providence is um, seated at the center and she is commanding fame to crown the coat of arm of the Barberini family. That is to say, this gigantic bees floating against a blue sky. And this is precisely the detail one finds in the, uh, on the ceiling of the Fiat Multipla. And um, the Barberini ceiling, with its dazzling use of uh, color, uh, multitudes of figures and, and powerful illusionism, is regarded as the first act of the Italian Baroque. And um, importantly, while the theme is a, is a religious one, this is very much uh, a triumph of the Barberini themselves uh, at a time when a member of the Barberini family was Pope uh, Urban VIII Barberini. So I think this element of self-fashioning, this um, element of family propaganda makes the uh, figurative element of the Fiat Multipla not just eye-catching, but also quite meaningful. And um, symbolic associations are at work also in this um, luxury car designed by uh, Garage Italia as well for rental company Hertz. And this is the Alfa Romeo Giulia Grand Tour. Um, and in this case, um, we find another old master inspired ceiling. Um, this is Apollo surrounded by the uh, Zodiac, um, in, uh, which was frescoed by uh, Taddeo and Federico Zuccari around uh, 1560 um, in uh, the um, Odescalchi um, castle in, in Bracciano near Rome. Um, and in this case, um, I think um, the, uh, the, 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 the focus of, um, of, of my um, next um, slides will be uh, on ultramarine blue, on the use of ultramarine blue. I think this is really a crucial element to consider here uh, because uh, ultramarine blue was uh, especially an especially important pigment in the Renaissance and early modern periods. Um, so um, let's um, try to consider it briefly. Um, since the, the Middle Ages, uh, lapis lazuli blue or ultramarine blue was 
um, has been particularly um, important, uh, precious as, as a pigment and also charged with religious and um, symbolical meaning. Um, especially alluding to purity and perfection. So it was uh, deployed to convey those qualities at a glance. Um, and this is certainly the case of the blue mantle of the Virgin. And the, the, the Virgin and Child that you see on the screen was the central panel of the Pisa altarpiece, uh, apolyptic, now disassembled, which was painted by Masaccio in 1426. And from the contract, which still exists, um, we gather how crucial the selection of pigments was for both the patron and the painter. So uh, we learned that the altarpiece was commissioned by the notary Giuliano di Colino for his family chapel in the church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Pisa. And the artist is Masaccio. Masaccio is um, an extraordinary master from Tuscany, who was later much admired by Michelangelo. And he was paid a remarkable sum, um, which had to include the costs for, of, of gold and uh, ultramarine blue. And what is interesting is that a clause in the contract specifies that only the purest pigments had to be used, should have been used. Um, so again, the, the rich blue pigment here is a symbol of the Virgin's purity, but also a testament and a visible sign of um, the patron's wealth and prestige. But um, what exactly is ultramarine blue and, and, and why was it so expensive? Um, so the stone from which ultramarine blue was prepared is lapis lazuli. Um, and, and during the Renaissance, lapis lazuli was um, transported from modern day Afghanistan to uh, Istanbul and to Persia. And from there, it was sent to Venice, Genoa and Artwell, uh, that is to say the major trade centers for pigments. And the stone, as you can see from this modern uh, reconstruction was worked up through uh, a laborious system which involved crushing, grinding, uh, washing and, and, and levigating the pigment. And this also uh, contributed to its um, high cost. So just, just to give you a, a figure, um, the cost of ultramarine blue was uh, roughly 24 times higher than any other blue and 160 times higher than all the other colors. So indeed a very uh, precious pigment. And um, this emphasis on the symbolic value of ultramarine blue uh, can still be found in the 17th century in an artist like Carlo Dolci. And Carlo Dolci was most um, active in Florence at the Medici court. And what you see here is the finest and, and most complex of um, his adoration of the kings. And here the virgin's blue dress is made with the costly uh, lapis lazuli pigment and gold is also lavishly used. So the king's gifts and, uh, and, and the crown appear gold, but are actually executed in, in paint. But the, the halos of the Holy Family and the light radiating from the child are made of real gold. And um, as, we have, as we have discussed, the Medici founded and patronized the workshop for hard stones in, in Florence. And it's, it's very likely that Dolce's meticulous craftsmanship was meant to rival that of Pietro Dure artisans and goldsmiths active at the Medici court. Such a stunning color. Uh, changing lanes a little bit, the realm of fashion has looked back at the old masters for centuries. This is a really intriguing industry to track because there are so many different applications for old master influence. Since you were just talking about precious materials, let's first consider couture as fashion's version of precious materials. Could you show us some examples here? Yes. Uh... 
So um, I think um, I've, I've selected a couple of examples, uh, which in my view are quite revealing of the inspire, inspiring power of the old masters upon the fashion industry. And they actually both come from a wonderful exhibition held at the Museum thyssen bornemisza in Madrid in 2019, which brought together the work of Cristobal Balenciaga, um, perhaps the most admired, the most influential fashion designer of all times, and um, Spanish paintings from the 16th to the 20th century. And um, especially since he moved to Paris in 1930, uh, Balenciaga uh, began to miss Spain um, and, and, and Spanish art. And at that point, he started to recall the masterpieces he had seen as a child in the collections of the aristocratic clients of his mother, who was a seamstress. And in this respect, a collection of uh, Spanish old master paintings of, of capital importance uh, for him uh, was the one displayed in the Palacio de Vistaona, where um, his mother worked for the Marchioness of Casa Torres. And Balenciaga particularly admired El Greco, um, an artist from, from Greece, um, who actually spent most of his life between Italy and Spain. And I think that the influence of El Greco's bold use of color, which he himself actually borrowed from Venetian artists such as Titian or Veronese, can be appreciated in Balenciaga's um, evening gown on screen. And uh, especially this um, shimmering and sophisticated effects of the yellow silk organza strongly recall the uh, garb of the Archangel Gabriel in Il Greco's Annunciation. And um, th this is what happens when a fashion designer of the 20th century like Balenciaga meets a, a 17th century um, fashion designer that is Francisco de Surbaran. And Surbaran was one of the greatest artists of the Spanish golden century of the Siglo de Oro, um, wh who is primarily known for his religious paintings. And so to, to the right uh, of the slide here, you can appreciate a marvelous and, and rather unusual depiction of Saint Elizabeth of Portugal, um, a medieval queen famous for her charity. Um, and according to the legend, she concealed her own riches among the folds of her clothes um, because her husband forbid her to give alms. So one day she was caught in this act of charity, but a miracle occurred and the gold she was carrying was turned into a bunch of roses. And this is the moment uh, chosen by Surbaran. And in the dress and overskirt uh, evening ensemble, uh, Balenciaga seems to respond to Surbaran's thick, layering of the skirts, um, especially in this opulent and, and precious rendition of the folds. And I, I believe that um, El Greco, Thurbaran and Balenciaga all share uh, an exquisite virtue that they, they are visionaries. Uh, El Greco was admired by Pablo Picasso and um, he is incredible in his expressive elongated bodies and flamboyant colors. Um, Surbaran um, for his, his modern silhouettes and meticulous rendition of textures and, and Balenciaga with his uh, impeccably glamorous um, creations and, and Christian Dior uh, famously declared that with fabrics uh, we can do what we can but Balenciaga does, does what he wants. Um, so I think each of them conceived unprecedented patterns for beauty, um, crystallizing what beauty was, but I think still defining what beauty is and will be.
These are such wonderful examples. Thank you so much, Julia. Now, as a contrast, I have to share the story. During one of my art history courses at Sotheby's, I Googled Caravaggio after class to look something up. And the first result that Google surfaced was this long sleeve sweatshirt by Off-White, which is a fashion brand started by Virgil Abloh, who's also the artistic director for Louis Vuitton Men's. We're in the era of digital reproduction, and it's so commonplace now from museum gift shops to big fashion houses. I know there's some variety within the answers to this question, but how did old masters react to their inventions being replicated or influencing contemporaries? And what do you think they'd make of all of this? Caravaggio might not have approved. <laughs> Caravaggio will, will, would certainly uh, have this <laughs> um, In fact, uh, unlike, and unlike most of 17th century uh, masters, Caravaggio didn't have a proper workshop. He didn't train any workshop assistant. And on the contrary, he was extremely jealous of his inventions. Um, so for instance, we learn from Caravaggio's contemporary biographer, Giulio Mancini, that Caravaggio feared that his paintings could be raped by copying. This is the crude expression uh, used by Mancini. But paradoxically, uh, Caravaggio had generations of followers and imitators, which really gave rise to the first European movement in Western art, um, subsequently labeled international Caravaggism. And Caravaggesque artists, deployed Caravaggio's lesson in, in various ways, either embracing Caravaggio's revolutionary style or new subject matters or departing from his prototypes. And this on screen is perhaps the most exploited Old Testament scene among Caravaggio's masters, Judith and Holofernes, um, and what you see here is a comparison between Caravaggio's version in Rome in Palazzo Barberini and the painting of the same subject by Italian artist Artemisia Gentileschi, possibly one of the finest interpreters of um, Caravaggio's lesson. And um, Artemisia Gentileschi reiterates successfully, I think powerfully, Caravaggio's theatrical setting, this dramatic use of lights and shadows, the chiaroscuro, and even emphasizes the sheer brutality of the action. At, at the opposite end of Caravaggism, we find a much more systematic, uh, more or less original reiteration of Caravaggio's secular subjects, particularly musicians, fortune tellers, card players, uh, which were clearly meant to satisfy an increasing demand on the art market. Uh, and this is perhaps the case of Mattia Preti's and Georges de la Tour's paintings. Um, and these are both examples of late Caravaggism. And um, they, they openly depart from Caravaggio's canvas of analogous subject, uh, which is here on the left. But as I said, Caravaggio was an exception. Uh, in fact, during the 17th century, it was common practice for artists to train pupils and hire assistants so that um, artworks should really be understood as collaborative works. Um, and this is certainly true for one of the most prolific and successful artists of the Baroque, um, the Flemish Peter Paul Rubens. Um, he put together the largest workshop in Europe, uh, working in partnership, we'd say today, with first rank masters. So for instance, in the Madonna on, on Floral Ref, uh, here on the left uh, of the slide, um, Rubens painted all the figures um, and his collaborator and close friend, Jan Bruegel the Elder, painted the still life elements of the flowers and the garland. And if one looks closer, uh, it's possible to differentiate Rubens' uh, thick and large brushwork from Bruegel's very fine miniature-like touches. And to the right, um, another very interesting collaborative work, um, the Prometheus Bound in Philadelphia, and in this case, 
Prometheus was painted by Rubens and the gigantic eagle by animalist, uh, animal specialist um, Franz Snyders. Another extremely prolific workshop was that of Rembrandt, uh, who also worked alongside very famous Dutch um, painters. Um, and uh, workshop practice implies that pupils copied the style uh, and the repertoire of the masters, but also deployed the very same tools, the same brushes, the same pigments, even the same live models of the master. And I think a case in point, is this portrait of an old woman by uh, Garrick Dow um, to the right, um, and a master who entered uh, Rubens, uh, Rembrandt's uh, workshop um, in 1628. And here, as you can see, the model and possibly uh, the book um, are the same that one finds in Rembrandt, Rembrandt's uh, Prophetess Anne, um, a, a painting which is traditionally uh, but mistakenly labelled Rembrandt's mother. Most of uh, Rembrandt's uh, workshop assistants and collaborators are still unknown, uh, even if we can assume that they reiterated um, very likely under Rembrandt's close inspection, uh, the master's inventions. And this can be gathered, for instance, um, from this comparison um, of uh, this comparison between these this two versions of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So to the left is Rembrandt's prototype and to the right, a rather good workshop replica, uh, perhaps slightly less accomplished in the depiction of the figure of the angel, especially the face. So from a scholarly point of view, there is still a lot of research to uh, be done to unveil the identity of Rembrandt's uh, pupils, but also to question uh, current attributions. But I won't, uh, I won't go into this now. Well, let's stay on the topic of copies for a moment because we have a very different perception of what copying means now because since the digital revolution, there isn't necessarily a huge amount of talent required or any talent at all a lot of the time to produce a copy or appropriate artwork. But in the past, as evidenced here, copies had a status and a dignity associated with them because in order to copy a master, you had to possess a certain amount of mastery yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think what is interesting is that from, from the late Renaissance, there's a noticeable increase in, in the production of copies and Rubens uh, was also a prolific copyist. And I think through his copies, we get a real sense of what you're saying, of, of the dignity and beauty of copies. So here from, from left to right is Titian's Fall of Man, uh, which was painted for Philip II of Spain around 1550, and Rubens' copy of it uh, produced during his trip to Madrid um, in 1628. And when we start comparing the two, we realize that Rubens' copy is, is much, much, much more in sight. So Rubens changes, for instance, Adam's positioning and um, enhances his muscles. He is completely naked and much more statuesque. And another interesting addition is the parrot to the left, uh, which is not present in Titian's work. And this is also a symbol of good and uh, redemption and in, in sharp contrast with the fox uh, closer to um, Eva's, um, Eve's um, feet. Um, and the fox is associated with evil and lust. Uh, another revealing uh, comparison, I think, is between uh, Raphael's portrait of Baldassar Castiglione one of the artist's most elegant and virtuosic portraits and Rubens' copy of it, um, which is at the Court Gallery in London. And again, in his copy, um, Rubens changes several details of Raphael's composition and notably, he fully includes Castiglione's hands. So there's this idea, which is something perhaps we've lost today, that a copy should rival and perfect its model. 
and this way uh, the, the, the copy becomes uh, aesthetically but also intellectually pleasing. In the 17th century, it was already quite difficult to purchase an original work by Raphael. And this also favored the proliferation of copies. So we know, for instance, that Giovanni Battista Salvi, better known as Il Sasso Ferrato, produced a copy after Raphael's renowned uh, deposition in the Borghese Gallery. Uh, and this copy, which is here to the right of the slide, was commissioned in 1630 by the monastery of San Pietro in Perugia. So I personally find the production um, and the market for copies in the Baroque period a very fascinating topic. Um, at their times, like today, copies arouse disappointment, but they can also surprise us. So I'll try to surprise you a little. To the left of the slide here is Perugino's Baptism of Christ in Rouen. Uh, and this is a very elegant, uh, balanced composition with figures um, immersed in a serene landscape, very typical of Perugino, who, is, who was famously uh, Raphael's master. And to the right, um, a copy of Perugino's work, now at the National Gallery in London, which for a time had been considered a rather modest artwork of the 19th century. So only a couple of years ago, new and more sophisticated analysis um, were performed on this copy and it emerged that the pigment used for yellow hues is typical of 17th century Italy. And also the, the brushwork, uh, which is especially visible in the background, in the landscape element of the background, suggests that this is not a 19th century work, but a much earlier um, painting. So uh, Perugino's baptism of Christ was still in San Pietro, um, in Perugia, when Sasso Ferrato was active there as a copyist, and um, therefore it seems very plausible, I think, um, that the work was actually produced uh, by Sasso Ferrato, and this, um, this, this work at the National Gallery could be regarded as a very interesting addition to Sasso Ferrato's catalogue. Sasso Ferrato, um, originally from the Marche region, but mainly active between Perugia and Rome in mid 17th century, is a heterodox and still mysterious artist. Um, and remarkably, Sasso Ferrato acted as a copyist of himself, um, reiterating in a, in a rather large number of, of replicas, a very exiguous number of religious themes. And an example of this is offered by this newly rediscovered Virgin in Prayer, um, a 17th century icon for private devotion uh, and chemical analysis of this um, of, the, of the pigments used in this painting um, allowed identifying the presence of the expensive ultramarine blue, which here is mixed with red lacquer to obtain purple nuances. Um, and, and this is only a selection of Sasso Ferrato's versions of this subject uh, in both museums and, and private collections. And they all share a strict control over the quality of the ultramarine blue pigment, but also a virtuoso handling of the brushwork. And this technical and stylistic excellence was possibly meant to create a brand for a specific clientele in Rome. And this is perhaps um, the final point uh, I want to emphasize, the, uh, the fact that very much like today, uh, artists of the past were fully aware of their patterns taste and of the trends of the art market. Um, artists were businessmen, um, and here on screen we can see uh, the self-portraits of two radically different uh, profiles. So to the left, Neapolitan artist Luca Giordano, better known as Luca Fopresto or Luca Paints Quickly, 
who ran a very large workshop and a very successful workshop. Um, and in a way, the rapid sketchiness of this self-portrait is a testament to this. And to the right, Carlo Dolce, a master of slowly perfection who worked in a, in a rather anti-economic fashion, adopting uh, precious pigments and gold. And interestingly, they knew each other. Um, and according to 17th century biographer, Filippo Baldinucci, Giordano aggressively approached Dolce, boasting his speed technique and urging him to become more efficient or he would have died of hunger. So very much like today, the, the art world uh, was often fierce, um, competitive, and yet incredibly exciting. This is such this a is great, such note, a to great end on, note to end on. Because it's an excellent example of how there have always been artists who've been better at business and artists who were willing to sacrifice everything to strive for creative perfection. Another incredible part of art's enduring link to money and, and power. Um, I think we have some time left for questions. So if you'd like to send us any in the Q and A, you can feel free to do that now. All right. Um, so Julia, someone is asking if the paintings inside of the cars were actually painted on the ceilings. Uh, no, they, it's, 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 they're made of um, textiles. Um, it's a okay. very specific um, material fabric, which is produced only by Alcantara. This is the specific brand. So it's a luxury um, textile uh, on which the, the, the ceiling is printed. Thank you. Okay, got it. And uh, what is levigating? Oh, rent, it means to render it very smooth. So the, the powder is, yeah, the lapis, the, the, a, power, a powder is created. And in fact, um, this is a very, very good point in a way, because one issue, one technical issue with um, lapis lazuli is that um, the uh, pigment doesn't become extremely fine at any point. So um, it really has to be diluted um, to, to, be, to be used uh, in, in a painting. It's quite coarse. Right. Um, right. There are a couple different questions that I'm going to consolidate. Uh, did the street artists that you mentioned at the beginning choose which work they wanted to use as inspiration or were they assigned a piece? That's a very good point. No, they, they chose um, their pieces. Um, and in fact, they even changed their mind uh, according to the um the, the specific corner or the site they decided to use um so for instance um the example uh, i showed you with the trumpet here um in, in that case um the artist originally chose uh, a different subject uh, which was um rather melancholic funerary uh, subject and then when he when he realized um that um the wall is so close to a number of primary schools, he opted for a different, a different interpretation of a different old master. And he selected at that point, Poussin's Triumph of David. So very, very good question, actually. Thank you. That's perfect for, for next to a kid's school. Uh, there is a new movie, The Lost Leonardo, about the Salvador Mundi painting and the controversy over whether it is a true Leonardo or a copy. Have you seen it? And what do you think about the controversy? And then they're also interested uh, as to where the Salvador Mundi is. Right. I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I had the answer to this question. I have seen the Salvador Mundi, actually, um, when it was... Uh, included um, in the exhibition devoted to Leonardo at the National Gallery in London. Um, I don't remember exactly the year, I think it was 2013. Um, and at the time, um, the, the attribution was quite controversial as well. And this was prior, obviously, to its um, sale. Um, at, at Christie's, um, and interestingly, it was sold in, in, a, in a contemporary art uh, auction. Um, so that that in itself is quite a revealing, um, I think, um, aspect to consider. 
as for the attribution i want um i want a uh, comment on that it's it's very controversial and and the provenance is quite controversial but there's extensive literature even even online which can be consulted and um yeah, I'd leave i leave it to specialists to decide i'm not a leonardo specialist so like by the most prominent uh, specialist on Leonardo, who's Martin Kemp. Um, so that's something to consider. I'm going to have to watch that. Uh, John is asking, none of these artists took advantage of woodcuts and metal etchings to make the kind of money that Dreher so successfully did. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why not? Uh, actually, that, that's a very, very good point. And in fact, it is very debated whether, whether uh, early prints by Caravaggio circulated in Italy and in Europe. An artist like Rubens actually um, had his works um, reproduced in prints to advertise them. So he did use prints to sponsor some of his inventions and um, to, to advertise his, his works. Um, so he took advantage of, uh, of print, um, but um, very, very good, very good point. I think among the artists I've mentioned, he's um, definitely one to consider. And obviously Raphael's fame was, was magnified by early prints. Um, I'm thinking of Marcantonio Raimondi, that um, allowed uh, the diffusion of his inventions across Europe um, from very early on. This is an interesting question. Are there copyrights on old master paintings? Who is compensated when fashion houses replicate famous pa paintings in their work, like the Louis Vuitton handbags? That's a very good question. Um, to be honest with you, I. I don't know exactly how it works for, for the fashion industry, but there are certain copyrights uh, for, uh, for works that are in museums and, and private collections. So uh, if I want to um, reproduce um, an old master painting um, in, in an article, I need to pay copyright fees. And I, I would think that the same applies at greater uh, scale to, to the fashion industries. Um, so I think the, the current owner uh, would be the the, the, institu or the current institution would be the, the point of reference for that. Um, but there is, there, there certainly is still uh, copyright. Right, a few questions about pigments. Uh, what were the other minerals like lapis lazuli uh, create to cre that were used to create the rich colors of green and red? Uh, that, that's a very good question. It really depends a lot on the um, geographical provenance of the uh, of, of the painting and also uh, on on the period. Um, so there were there were different um, different ways through which hues of blues and and and, and green uh, could have been used. So malachite is, is used for um, for green, for instance, and you would have then earth pigments for uh, browns. Um, so it really a, a lot of a lot of um, different materials were used for um, for, for pigments. Um, and one thing which is important to consider that that's a very good question. We could go on discussing that. I think it really it's difficult to answer um, broadly. Each um, each country and each period used um, different uh, different pigments and a different variety of pigments. But what is interesting to consider is that at some point um, the same the same color was obtained through different uh, pigments and different processes. So, for instance, blue lapis lazuli blue at some point um, ceased to be used in favor of the cheaper uh, Prussian blue. Uh, which was um, introduced um, consistently in, in the 19th century. Um, so it's, it's very important to know exactly in which uh, region and, uh, and uh, pigments were used and until what time, they were, until which century um, they were used because they will help dating uh, a specific painting and even uh, putting forward attributions. Um, or backing specific attributions. So that's that's a 
very, very good question. It's a very manifold one. I hope, I hope broadly I've answered this. Um, thank you. And then as a, as a sort of follow-up from somebody else, uh, how long do the pigments last? They, they said they heard pictures were often repainted during the life of the artist. Yes, that's also a very, very good point and a, and a, and a rather excellent question and, and, and a, a rather difficult one to answer because it really depends on the technique here. Um, so I think, um, and I think um, it, it's, it's a very good question if you think, if we um, consider an artist like Carlo Dolci, when the technique is exquisite, this is the case of Carlo Dolci, but also of uh, Vermeer, um, we have the very fortunate um, instance um, in which the, the, the painting is still on its original stretcher and it's, it's in, a, in a pristine state of preservation. And this happens very, very rarely. But the Adoration of the Magi, which is at the National Gallery that I showed you, is one case in point. And um, Fermi's uh, painting at Kenwood House in, in London is also uh, fortunately in, in a pristine condition. So when pigments are used skillfully and the technique is a particularly accomplished one, uh, it can last for centuries. Excellent. Um, there's a couple of questions here about, I'm gonna read this one, appreciate your insights uh, regarding the artist's awareness of the original works they copied and or those who commissioned them, was there a particular travel circuit they would have frequented in common? And then someone else is asking that they have an understanding that Delatour never visited Rome. So how would he have made such a copy of the Caravaggio? Yes, it's inspired. That, that's a very good, good point. In fact, it's, it's, it's really, I think, he's inspired by the theme. It's, it's the wish to produce. Um, that specific theme for the art market. And in fact, uh, De La Tour knew Caravaggio only through Van Ontrust um, and, um, uh, and, and not directly. Uh, and, and so this is, this is indeed a very, very good point. And I think it's the fame of Caravaggio. And it's, it's even now, so that, that very painting was produced in the 1630s. So he already had two generations, well, sort of um, 20 years of, of, of Caravaggism um, to, to, to consider uh, and, and to use as a point of reference, but, but very, very good point. Um, and the other, um, to, to go back to the other question on, on copies, um, I think, what, what was, the, was it, um, do they, did, they, did um, 17th century artists looked at the same artists? Um, yes. Very often, yes, that's that's an excellent point. Um, a very, very good question. And I think, um, yes, if we consider Raphael as a point of reference, Raphael was um, certainly a point of reference for um, an artist like Annibale Carracci, uh, Nicola Poussin, when Poussin um, arrived um, in Rome for, for Guido Reni, um, and uh, Michelangelo was um, a very, uh, important point of reference for Caravaggio himself and for uh, Annibale Carracci. And so I think um, the, the idea of old masters uh, and the idea that um, a group of um, 16th century artists could really become um, an important uh, point of reference, the masters for um, 17th century artists uh, really started to um, started to, uh, to, to, to consolidate in, 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 the, in the 17th century. And what is interesting is that uh, 15th century artists were not particularly um, famous, were not particularly uh, copied. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting that Carlo Dolci and Sasso Ferrato look back at the Quattrocento, uh, at the 15th century. The 15th century was slightly less exploited um, at the beginning. And it would be exactly uh, the opposite um, through the century. Um, so various masters um, had uh, their fortune um, and um, uh, an afterlife um, at various stages of Western art. But yes, indeed, a number of artists were, were, were important for uh, and copied at the same time by 
various artists with with very different backgrounds and uh, and, and provenance. So that's a very good point to highlight. Thank you. Well, we could keep going for a while, but I know we're a bit over time. There have been a few questions about whether this recording will be available afterwards. It will be on the YouTube page of the National Arts Club uh, and I think should be up by Monday. Um, thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, but thanks very much for being with us for this talk. Thank you, Dr. Weston, for diving into this topic with me. And we've had so much fun researching it. Uh, and of course, another big thank you to the National Arts Club for having us. To learn more about joining the National Arts Club, you can email them at admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. Uh, wishing you all a beautiful weekend wherever in the world you're watching from. Bye.